I'm Professor Shadia Fahim. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the British University in Egypt. Um, welcome to the International Research Seminar series hosted by the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and organized by the Research Center for Irish Studies at the BUE and presented in collaboration with Africa Alta. Uh, today's research seminar is titled, What is Africa to Irish Studies? The title is quite interesting. Our guest speaker is Professor Colin Parson and our guest moderator is Dr. Jean Claire. The duration of this research seminar is approximately 60 minutes, including questions and answers. And it will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel for all those who are interested in this area of research. This evening research seminar is meant to engage scholars and our audience in academic discussions that could lead to a potentially new research related to African and Irish studies, both of which are new research interests for our Faculty of Arts and Humanities. We hope that you will walk away from this research seminar, whether you're an early career researcher or established academic with new ideas that inspire your future research work. I will start by introducing our guest moderator, uh, Professor Jean, uh, Dr. Jean Claire, then leave the floor to Dr. Claire to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Colin Parsons. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jean Claire is inspector at the Ministry of Higher and, and Secondary Education and an academic in the Department of English at Libreville, Gabon. He is an active member of Africa Alta, the association that connects African educators together and allows for a sustained network of scholars to, uh, to interact with the wider international community. Dr. Clare is also the British Council uh, country uh, liaison person for Gabon and supervisor of English teachers associations at Gabon. The, um, he is the author of the online book co-authored with the British Council, Methodology for Starter Teachers. His later research work at Omar uh, Bongo University is titled The Theme of Death in Shinwa Achibi's Things Fall Apart and Peter Abraham's Vision of Apartheid Through Dark uh, Testament, Mind Boy and Tell Freedom. Well, uh, Dr. Claire, the floor is yours now to introduce uh, Professor uh, Colin Parson. I would like to thank you, and I would also like to thank uh, Professor Collins. Um, I'm quite honored and pleased to moderate this uh, session, this seminar. I will start by introducing uh, Professor Colin Parsons. He is uh, an associate professor of English at the Georgetown University in Washington, District of Columbia, where he uh, supervises, he directs the Global Irish Study Initiative. This is an initiative. And he is the author of the Ordinance and Modern Irish Literature, published by Oxford University in the year 2016, and co editor of Science, Technology, and Modern Irish Literature. This was uh, published in Syracuse in 2019. This is one of the most recent publications. Uh, he also have relocations, reading culture in South Africa. So this, uh, our guest knows a little bit about uh, Africa as he's been in South Africa. And uh, also he uh, taught in Cape Town in the year 2015. And he also published a special issue of the journal Interventions on Ireland and South Africa in the year 2021. This is the current publication that everybody can enjoy. He is currently editing a book for Cambridge University Press on Irish literature in global perspective. And is finishing a monograph on astronomy, 
and modernist literature. Before coming to Georgetown University, he taught at the University of Cape Town in South Africa and at Columbia University. So it means that uh, this man is an accomplished uh, professor, writer, and author. And uh, uh, this afternoon for us who are in Africa, and maybe this morning for those who are in the United States, we do have great expectations from Professor Colin Parson with the title of this seminar, What is Africa to Irish Studies? Professor Colin Parsons, I'm quite happy and quite honored to give the floor to you for this uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jean-Claire Nguyen-Mondong, uh, for your introduction, and to Dean and Shadia Fahim for presiding over the seminar, and of course to Dr. Rani Rafi Khalil for uh, inviting me uh, in the first place. It's a real pleasure to be with you. This morning, um, I'm coming to you from California, which is not my home. I live in Washington, D.C., and um, I'm dealing with some new technology here in front of me in somebody else's office. So um, there may be some glitches. I don't know. It, it, it should work. Um, let me know. I don't mind being interrupted if nothing is actually working. You should be seeing a PowerPoint presentation right now. There aren't many slides. Um, I'm going to talk uh, for maybe 45 minutes um, this morning, and then um, I really, really welcome um, your questions. I really, um, this, this is important to me that I hear from you. It's so lovely to see so many people uh, on the line and um, from um, India to Mali to um, uh, elsewhere. I've already seen people um, sort of placing, placing their location in the chat. So it's nice to see people from, from all around the world. Not surprising given what a global city Cairo is, uh, what a global university, the British University of Egypt is. Um, so thanks especially to all of those of you who are um, listening and watching from Cairo for tuning in very late on a summer Friday evening. I really appreciate this. I know that you probably have better things to be doing, and um, so I'll try and keep you entertained. But most importantly, I want to um, extend my congratulations to the British University of Egypt on the establishment of the Research Center for Irish Studies. The importance of this step for a field that has so often been confined uh, for very obvious reasons to the Anglophone world, that is Ireland, Britain, the US especially, um, the importance of this research center can't be overstated. Along with major strides taken by Ephesus, the European Federation of Associations and Centers of Irish Studies, um, of which I understand BUE is a member, I think I see in this new research center a significant shift in the geographies of how we produce knowledge about Ireland. The fact that BUE sits, of course, at the crossroads of Middle East, North Africa, um, and the continent of Africa, means that it brings to the field of Irish studies a very welcome dual aspect, as well as a keen sense of the anomalies of history and geography, with borders stretching from Sudan to Israel, facing the African continent, but not wholly of it, and facing also West Asia and the Arabian Peninsula, the location of Cairo and the location of the British University of Egypt is incredibly important to how we think about and produce knowledge. And in many ways, this is what I'm gonna be talking about today, about what um, the Australian sociologist Raywin Connell calls in her book, Southern Theory, the geolocation of knowledge, the inextricable connections between where we make knowledge and how we make it. I'm really humbled to have been asked to speak today and to share some ideas with this audience. Like everybody else, I wish this were in person. Uh, I think we're probably all sick of hearing this now after a year and a half, but I really do wish we, it could be in person and it would feel a little bit less like an information download from me and more like a genuine conversation and a more relaxed opportunity for a sharing of ideas and knowledge across disciplines and continents, um, a sort of a geographical epistemological encounter. I, as I say, I really encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A, to share your own ideas about Irish studies, African studies, and how those two things might be put together, a very small, con a very small country on the um, very edge of Europe and a very large continent. Uh, not exactly comparable, but because they're incomparable, that can make for some really interesting uh, questions. So I'm taking this opportunity speaking to this audience in particular located in North Africa 
to put together some thoughts and ideas I've been juggling with for quite some time, uh, really since I taught, as um, Dr. Nguyen Mun Dong uh, mentioned, at the University of Cape Town, and I had the privilege of immersing myself uh, as an outsider to the field in the fields of African studies and global South studies. There, I found myself teaching James Joyce's very famous 20th century novel, Ul Ulysses, to a largely Southern African audience. And I was confronted with the question of what it means to read Irish literature in an African context, even as South Africa itself grapples with its own exceptionalism or its exemplarity, the extent to which it is African or not African. And I thought even about what it meant to read Ulysses, a novel about decolonization in many ways, at a moment of the resurgence of the discourse of decolonization, especially in African and global South studies, as an ongoing future-facing political project rather than a finished historical event. So I'm gonna share with you some thoughts, some ideas, some of which have already been published uh, and others of which remain more speculative about the necessity of articulating African and Irish studies. Um, and I realize, of course, the DUE Center uh, and the people on the line um, cross disciplines in really innovative ways. So I'm aware that my audience and members will come from many different, a wide range of disciplines and fields. I'll be speaking specifically about my own discipline of literary studies, but I'll try to keep it as sort of broadly relevant as possible. And as I say, I welcome questions. So why this question? What is Africa to Irish studies? When Dr. Rani Rafi Khalil reached out to me and invited me to take part in this research seminar series, this was the question that first came to mind. I'm excited about the possibilities of this research center based in Egypt. Um, and I really wanted to think about how that might actually restructure how we imagine Ireland. In one sense, the question of why Africa, why, what is Africa to Irish studies is a result of the rapidly shifting democratic realities of the island of Ireland, both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, where a wave of migration from Africa to Europe since about 2000 has very significantly increased the population of Irish people of African descent. It still remains about 1.5% in the Republic and somewhere about 0.3% in Northern Ireland. Um, but that is significantly larger than it was, say, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and this shift, this demographic shift is slow to be recognized as permanent and growing, though scholarship on more recent immigrants from Africa and elsewhere has very rapidly increased in, last year, in the last few years, thanks in no small part to the hard work of those who've been working tirelessly to bring attention to the presence of Africans in the Irish artistic and literary landscape, from Malatu Ucho Kore and Emma Dabiri to even Joseph. Many, in fact, the largest African population in Ireland is Nigerian, and many of the sort of you know, spoke, prominent spokespersons for um, uh, Africans in Ireland are Nigerian. At the same time, there's also a serious lack of investment in, on the island of Ireland in the study of Africa, but also South and Southeast Asia. There's a deficit of knowledge for all kinds of reasons having to do with resources and a very slow to change academy of the Global South in particular and of Africa, uh, Global South in general of Africa in particular. So the question really is, why must Ireland engage with and learn from the African continent? And why must the field of Irish studies in particular broaden its scope to a robust and meaningful engagement with Africa? Not just, I would say, one that treats the continent as a site of development and uplift as so many sort of European countries do, as the object of knowledge, but to treat Africa as the subject of knowledge and a generator of knowledge. I don't mean to say that there's been no work on, uh, in the field of thinking about Africa and Ireland. In fact, um, Dean Fahim was at the forefront of the study of Irish and Egyptian literature when she published in a volume edited by Mary Massoud in 1996. And I would point to, among many others, the work of Ida Corley on Ken Sarawiba or Kevin O'Sullivan's ex excellent critical history of Irish humanitarian engagement with Africa or Fiona Bateman's work on Irish missionaries in Africa. We could also think of Nathan Sir Seitzma's excellent work on Northern Irish and Nigerian poetry, or work done on the influence of W.B. Yeats, Seamus Heaney, and others on African writers from Achebe and Shoyinka to Chris Abani. Africa is present in the study of Irish literature, and Ireland is present in African literature. It's not an untilled field, it's not an untouched field, though there's certainly more, much more to be done across the board 
in delinking the study of Irish literature from the Ireland from the island of Ireland itself and tracing its deterritorialized past and future. So what I'm going to do here today is building on the work of so many others to try to think about the complex politics of trying to think Africa and Ireland together and to imagine what a future relationship might look like, not a relationship based on a shared colonial past. Ireland was colonized, as we know, the entire African continent uh, will also experience European colonization. So I want to think about a relationship that's not just based on that shared colonial history, but brightened by a shared decolonial or anti-colonial future. But I'm going to think about it by starting with another quite anomalous place at the other end of the African continent, South Africa, and suggest that we could think, as the critic David Lloyd has insisted for years, about a differential analysis of highly strange, highly idiosyncratic cultural landscapes, rather than comparisons of similarities enforced by colonialism's desire to make all differences the same. So, I mean, I do have a couple of pictures here. I think that the entire history of South African and Irish political and cultural entanglements can be seen in the story of a moving monument. It's a story told in a photo essay by Johannesburg-based photographer Christo Doherty. This monument commemorates the volunteers who fought in the Irish Transvaal Brigade, their Irish soldiers uh, fought in the Irish Transvaal Brigade, Brigade on the side of the Boers in the South African War. And the monument was installed in 1975 at the foot of a very prominent tower, the Brixton Television Tower in Johannesburg. Among its champions was Hendrik Favoord, the so-called architect of apartheid, uh, and the prime minister at the time, who contributed to the cost of this monument, forming a small part of a cultural strategy of the Bruderbund, a secret society dedicating to advancing white nationalist influence in South African culture. The monument to the Irish brigades, these Irish soldiers who fought in the South African war, was erected some 70 years after the end of the war, with a clear mandate to establish the genealogy of the present and lend to the apartheid regime some kind of historical sort of stamp. It helped that this stamp came with traces of international and, so, and solidarity, because just as South Africa was being um, riven by boycotts and sanctions, uh, these were ramping up in the 1970s, a monument like this established the international credentials of a racist republic that was fast losing support around the world. But the monument fell into disrepair uh, over the next couple of decades. So it was built in 1975, fell into disrepair, a sign that there was actually no special reason to keep alive the memory of Irish support for the Boers or the Afrikaners in South Africa, especially after the end of apartheid. The formerly unloved monument, however, found a new home in the year 2000. So what I'm showing you here, the picture I'm showing you here is where it used to be clearly unloved, abandoned area in the middle of Johannesburg. So the unloved monument found a new home in the year 2000. From near oblivion in Johannesburg, it was moved to Orania, which is, um, if you do not know of Orania, it is an improbable place. It is a whites only town on the border of the Northern Cape and the Free State. It still exists as a sort of racist defined town in South Africa. And this monument was cleaned up it was installed on a new monument there, a living museum to monuments in, in many ways to white South Africans and a museum of anachronistic memorials. It's basically this monument to Irish freedom fighters, what was thought of as freedom fighters at the time, has been moved to a sort of a racist enclave. What are we to make of this removal of the Irish Transvaal Brigade monument? It's something of a twisted, distorted final chapter uh, in the story of the Irish engagement in an inspiration of anti-colonial action around the world. But it's also a testament to a strain of white supremacy that has always been present, but hidden in the Irish struggle for self-determination. Perhaps those who moved the monument to its new location, these you know, uh, you know, essentially racist white supremacists in South Africa today, perhaps those who moved the monument to its new location in Irania were not wrong to think that this is actually a monument to struggle against the British Empire, but also a sort of a hidden celebration of racial violence. If the history of South Africa in the 20th century is one of long racial struggle, the Irish began the history on the wrong side of that struggle. 
fighting alongside of people who opposed the British Empire, but didn't oppose the racism of the empire. So that's one story about how we might think about the complex way in which Ireland and South Africa come together uh, in history. But I'll tell you another one, make this uh, relatively short. Ah, there we go, sorry. Um, my slides are slightly out of order. A major, and you'll, you'll recognize this person, a major international traveling exhibition marking the 100th anniversary of Nelson Mandela's birth arrived in Dublin in the summer of 2018, so quite recently. The exhibition was, was hosted in Kilmainham Jail which is a space uniquely suited to pay homage to a man who spent 27 years incarcerated. Kilmainham Jail is also an appropriate venue to mark the relations between two countries in which the history of incarceration is so central to their national imaginings, in which the prison forms such an important part, as Fiona McCann has argued. Kilmainham Jail played host in its time to many political prisoners who fought the might of the British Empire. Among them are Robert Emmett, leader of a doomed 1803 uprising against the British, and a profound influence on the political philosophy of Thabo Mbeki of South Africa. There also were incarcerated, and in some cases executed, the leaders of the 1916 Easter Rising against the British in Ireland, including John McBride, who was one of the leaders of the Irish South African Brigade. He went to South Africa to fight on the side of the Boers. With less of a global presence in the iconography of resistance and freedom than Robben Island does, the prison museum at Kilmainham nonetheless stands in the national imaginary in Ireland as a symbol of both colonial oppression and anti-colonial activism. Before being allowed to see the 2018 Mandela exhibition, visitors were led around the prison cells where the 1916 leaders were housed and tour guides explicitly reminded the visitors of the anti-colonial affinities between Ireland and South Africa. The name of Kader Asmal, leader of the Irish anti-apartheid movement and later the first minister for water in South Africa was invoked alongside John McBride and many others. Guides also paid, uh, called attention to the workers of an Irish grocery chain who refused in the 1980s to handle South African goods and catapulted apartheid to the top of the Irish news cycle for years afterwards. This everyday resistance of grocery chain workers is still regularly spoken about uh, on tours of Robben Island in Cape Town, enhancing the impression, the impression of a sort of a call and echo between carceral, between prison spaces in South Africa and Ireland. The exhibition experience was touted by its curators at Kilmainham Jail as a celebration of the deep ties of affinity and political action between South Africa and Ireland that arose over the course of a long struggle against colonial rule. And yet the content of the exhibition itself made little of these ties. The story that was told was a detailed sort of saint's life of Nelson Mandela, whose historical and political and geographical locations had very little in common with and were largely unaffected by Ireland. A panel on, South, on uh, Nelson Mandela's three visits to South Africa, um, to, to, to Ireland rather, attempted to stitch South Africa and Ireland together with fine sentiments from Mandela and Mary Robinson, while one on the Irish anti-apartheid movement was more robust, recognizing the importance of that movement in both Ireland and South Africa, and celebrating the fact that the first draft of the South African Bill of Rights was completed on the kitchen table of Kader and Louise Asmal, his wife, in Dublin. So the South African Bill of, draft, of Rights was first drafted in Ireland. There are, of course, all kinds of reasons why there was a mismatch between the claims of the curators and the content of the exhibition. Um, but it wasn't hard to be left the impression that long heralded affinities between South Africa and Ireland that engender frequent comparisons and expressions of solidarity have been all too frequently more a matter of acknowledgement and gesture rather than real engagement. Haunting these two stories of the monument to the Irish Brigade that becomes essentially a monument to white supremacism and the, uh, and the, the Mandela exhibition in Dublin. Haunting these two stories is the specter of solidarity that has dominated South African Irish relations since the turn of the last century. And that continues to leave traces in the work of any critic, th critic thinking across and between post-colonial cultures. So if we think about Africa and Ireland together, we often think about solidarity, anti-colonial action, anti-colonial feeling and movement. But solidarity is a fairly changeable force 
its meaning and its impact constantly under contestation and negotiation. The critic, the sociologist Rajni Shrikant, writes about South African solidarity with Palestine, saying that Palestine's current South African moment, that is the, when we talk about Palestine as, as um, experiencing apartheid, is high on symbolism, but very low on particulars. The benefits to Palestinians of this kind of solidarity are not clear, Shrikant writes, but what it offers to South Africans is a moment to be restored to the robustness of their prior activism and to burnish the luster of their stated ideals of a multiracial democracy. Shrikant recognizes the opportunistic use of solidarity here, at least social, if not political solidarity, for a national self-imagining that may help us think through Irish South African solidarities or even Irish African in general South Afri uh, solidarities. What South Africa has long offered to the Irish imagination is the chance to be restored to this kind of prior activism that Shrikant talks about whether that's the activism of the now over commemorated revolutionary period in Ireland, Ireland is now, yeah, um, uh, we should say, um, limping towards the end of a 10 year uh, commemoration of a revolutionary period, um, or the civil rights movement and the IRA struggle of the 1970s and 1980s in Northern Ireland. Indeed, Northern Ireland at this very moment is, as anybody would know, in dire need of a reminder of its own place as a beacon of peacemaking in the 1990s just as South Africa is. So these kinds of transnational solidarity can be the result of a displaced desire to revive revolutionary activism from a place where that seemed no longer possible or feasible or just too inconvenient. When it's too difficult to um, engage in revolutionary activism against the world that you live in, it's all too easy to sort of remember and commemorate a previous activism. This is not to, to diminish the felt experience of solidarity, especially in the 1970s and 1980s in the Irish anti-apartheid movement, but to historicize and to contextualize it, recognizing the complex impulses that accompany the feeling. Kader Asmal, the leader of the Irish anti-apartheid movement, uh, an exiled South African. So in 1971, Kader Asmal um, uh, wrote a report for the United Nations on apartheid. And he identified what he called an instinctive solidarity of the Irish people with the freedom struggle in South Africa. He attributed this to the fact that the Irish people have themselves undergone the experience of imperial rule and in this century have had recourse to, to force to free their land and themselves from foreign domination. Historical experience of colonization, Kader Admal leads us to believe, Asmal leads us to believe, results in an instinctive abhorrence of injustice. In 1971, the Irish Revolution, which happened in the 19-teens and 1920s, was still within living memory. And that argument may have held sway. There may have been an instinctual solidarity. In fact, when the Irish government finally or formally declared its opposition to apartheid in 1966, the Minister for External Affairs, Frank Aiken, recalled his personal experience and personal memories, not experiences, sorry, memories of the South African War. The assumption that a shared history of colonization will engender solidarity will be repeated many, many years later uh, in a slightly different form by the influential post-colonial critic Luke Gibbons when he writes that Ireland is a first world country, but with a third world memory. On this assumption, that despite its current ge geopolitical and economic conditions as a wealthy European nation, Ireland retains an identity as part of the global south. A generation of post-colonial scholarship was in fact built on this. But I think we need to be wary of any argument built on an appeal to instinctiveness. Speaking in Dublin in 1916, the Ghanaian Prime Minister, or 1960, the Ghanaian Prime Minister and Kwame Nkrumah paid tribute to what he called those Irish leaders of the last century who realized that the struggle for Ireland, the uh, struggle of Ireland for independence was not the struggle of one country alone, but part of a world movement for freedom. The sentiment, Nkrumah's sentiment, played well in Dublin, um, but its seamless conflation of Irish and African freedom struggles glosses over the most intractable of differences between Ireland and Africa. Colonial racial formations and the racist inheritances that have governed relations between Africa and Europe. The histories of Irish and African independence struggles and post-colonial nationhood diverge on the question of race. 
That is not to say that Ireland was sort of in the 19th century unproblematically white or that Irish people were unproblematically white, but that there is a vast gulf between how Ireland was integrated into the empire and its racial structures and how Africa was integrated the, into the empire. Ireland's entry into the club of developed European nations after World War II, and especially since the 1970s and 1980s, was eased by the absence of imagined racial and ethnic differences. Irish people were long figured as white. So there's a danger in this kind of citational practice in which post-colonial struggles become rhetorically but not historically linked. I'm going to borrow a term and an idea from a really brilliant book by the scholar Antoinette Burton, who reads African-Indian relations in the late 20th century and what she calls the politics of post-colonial citation, when we sort of cite another post-colonial place um, without really engaging. And Antoinette Burton sees a sort of a vertical hierarchical relation of power and identity between India and Africa as being hidden behind an overt claim for horizontal or non-hierarchical relations. Postcolonial and Global South affinities, Antonin Burton suggests, are fraught with hidden asymmetries or um, difficulties. She tells a story of what she calls brown over black, uh, complicating our desires for South-South or post-colony, post-colony solidarity, and also affirming the enduring power of, um, of such sentiments in the, in the face of their patent falsity. But solidarity, Burton shows, doesn't always need a level playing field. Solidarity can function rhetorically in the absence of any actually existence or even existing or even desired equality. Solidarity can erase historical specificity and structural differences in the name of an ill-defined idea of fellow feeling. And I should stop here and say, um, I mean, I think um, we, uh, this will not be news to anybody in Cairo right now is that, of course, there was a strong, and I know um, Dara Gannon is on the line here and, uh, and has done some work in this area, but there's a strong sentiment of solidarity across Egypt and Ireland in the early 20th century that the sort of the, the, the language of anti-colonial resistance is shared across these sites in the early 20th century. The question is, to what extent is it gestural or rhetorical, and to what extent is it political and, and historical? But the language of solidarity and affinity, let me just keep an eye on the time here. Yeah, I'll, I'll, the language of solidarity and affinity continues to pattern South African Irish comparisons uh, and indeed general, more generally African Irish comparisons, concealing the reality that the imagined distance between Africa and Ireland is under constant negotiation. One moving closer to the other according to and, and in response to certain crises and opportunities the observation of which affords us a useful vantage point from which to understand the purchase of memories of colonialism and conceptions of post-coloniality in both Ireland and Africa. To adapt a phrase from the critic Walter Benjamin, speaking of Ireland and South Africa together, or Ireland and Africa together, recognizing their affinities or their shared histories, their solidarities, their imaginations, is not always to speak of things as they really were, it's to seize hold of a memory as it flashes up in a moment of danger and crisis. Why do these comparisons tend to reach peaks at moments of political instability? Placing South Africa and Ireland side by side has obvious payoffs, not least of which is highlighting instabilities and challenged, shared, challenges shared across post colonies. But I want to just sort of you know, point out here that um, one of the ways that South Africa has been used in the Irish imagination is uh, largely around the division between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, or the division across that border uh, on the island of Ireland that seems to be coming hard, becoming harder and harder every day. There was, excuse me, there's a, different, there was a difference in the way that communities in the North of Ireland and in the Republic engaged with South Africa in the 1980s and 1990s. For many, there was a special connection between Northern Ireland and South Africa, as the Catholic or nationalist community saw their plight mirroring that of colored and black South African um, communities. In the 1990s, there was a robust exchange of visitors and ideas between the African National Congress and the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. And ANC figures like Cyril Ramaphosa and Mac Maharaj helped to consolidate and underwrite the peace process in Northern Ireland. 
At the same time, a significant element of Northern Irish society has sought and still seeks a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Ireland, a question that has implications for cultural production in Northern Ireland, as Connell Parr has argued. So those are the sort of the, the ways of thinking about Ireland, Northern Ireland and South Africa in an anti-colonial formation. But we tend to forget that these moments of anti-colonial solidarity um, and working against that is the fact that the South African ruling racist nationalist party uh, supported loyalists and unionists in Northern Ireland, those who wanted to stay within the British, uh, within the United Kingdom. This can be seen most revealingly in the fact that Arms Corps, the South African Arms Procurement Agency, sent guns and ammunition to loyalist paramilitaries who helped the apartheid state in its self-deficient and self-definition. So th this helped the apartheid state in South Africa in its self-definition as a guarantor of hegemonic power and as a friend to the United Kingdom. In this sense, we could say that Africa has become especially potent in the formation of present day Northern Ireland even more so than the Republic. Indeed, we could say that a certain element of the politics of present day Northern Ireland and South Africa has been formed in the crucible of that very prison that we spoke about earlier in Kilmainham Jail and in Robin Island. Robin Island. South Africa and Ireland are contingent historical formations that act upon each other when placed into conversation. They don't sort of exist as ontological things in themselves, they are relational. And they significantly exceed the physical borders that they define, taking part in a transnational economy of ideas, texts, forms. But while we might agree that these two locations can and have been mutually constitutive, they sort of formed each other from the South African war to the Northern Irish peace process. It's, all the, it's also the case that there's an asymmetry of interest that Irish scholars tend to be more interested in a particular element of South Africa, a particular idea of South Africa, than, our, than South African scholars tend to be in, 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 in Ireland. I'm gonna skip um, ahead a little bit, um, but I wanted, so what I wanted to do there was give you a sense of the complexities of what it means to think about Ireland and Africa together by offering a particular example of South Africa. And it's a complicated example, obviously, in part because it's a settler colony. It's not like Nigeria or Ghana or Angola. Um, it has a, a long and more complicated history, but it does give you a sense of the complications of trying to align Ireland with any particular place on the African continent and claim some kind of shared history or solidarity. So I'm going to end this um, discussion of, uh, this is going to be a very small sort of, um, sort of image, so um, my apologies for that, but I can, um, I can read it to you. I'm going to end this discussion of Ireland and South Africa by way of a tweet, because what, how else would you end a discussion? Um, by a South African asylum seeker in Ireland, Bulelani Mfako, who has become a powerful spokesperson for a disenfranchised and imprisoned community of asylum seekers, primarily African in Ireland. Um, in 2019, he attacked a plan to solve Ireland so that the Minister for Housing had a plan to solve Ireland's housing crisis, which is a shortage of housing, by introducing a system called co-living, where essentially you cram more people into less space, comparing, and, and, and Faco compared this proposed high density single room occupancy housing units to apartheid era hostels for workers in South Africa. In doing this, he skirts around old, these older stories that I've been talking about of connections and circulations of solidarity and affinity. And he builds a new kind of comparison between Ireland and South Africa as a provocation that makes no mention of shared histories and deep sympathies. Indeed, Mfako imagines a regime of the management of lower income workers across the world today, inspired by the lessons of apartheid. His tweet says, um, the Irish government wants to build glossy apartheid South Africa kind of hostels. Even the flats in colored communities were better than what the Irish government wants. They want 40 people to share a kitchen, much like some direct provision, which is the Irish um, sort of carceral system or imprisonment system for asylum seekers. Instead, Mfako, instead of thinking about shared histories and deep sympathies between Ireland and Africa, he imagines a regime of the management of lower income workers across the world. He himself has been detained in this kind of grim asylum seeker accommodation in Ireland, um, known by the sort of euphemism of direct provision. 
uh, and a, a sort of an idea of asylum see an idea of incarceration that could be drawn straight from the pages of jm Kutsia's the childhood of jesus or the work camp in the life of times of michael k if you know those novels only in the irish detention centers the, in, the inmates have been expressly forbidden to work a supposedly humanitarian inversion of the idea of a work camp in mfaco's tactic a reviled south african institution the worker hostels emerges into the Irish public sphere and perfectly captures the unspoken and largely unseen brutality of the present moment in Ireland. While we may think of the so-called migrant crisis in Europe as signaling a new pattern in, in a new shift in patterns of human settlement and playing out between North Africa and Southern Europe as people cross the Mediterranean, Mfako's intervention here in this one tweet it's funny I just spend that long talking about a tweet, but it is, he, you know, he's, he's, he's been sort of working this for a very long time. This is just an example of it. In fact, his intervention here reminds us that both Ireland and South Africa form a system of policing, transporting, devaluing, and exploiting the bodies of others, of which apartheid was only the most visible recent example. What Mfako does here is it takes the material conditions of the global South, of Africa, as a generator of knowledge about the present and the future of the global north. To borrow a phrase from two anthropologists of Africa, John and Jean Komaroff, it's as if Euro-America is growing towards the global south, as if the global south holds the key to the future of a world divided by contradictions and inequities of capitalism and torn apart by climate change. This is from John and Jean Komaroff's book, theory from the South, um, a really excellent sort of, you know, um, uh, engagement with the idea of imagining Africa in particular, but the global South in general as a generator of knowledge, uh, not as an object of knowledge. For the Komarovs, present day Sub-Saharan Africa is busy living not in some kind of benighted past, but in the, but in the future of our planet. And the strategies for survival in the face of planetary collapse are being developed right now in social and political formations of the global South. The implication is not that somehow Africa has all the answers, though their work does seem to lean a little bit too much on that structure of argument, but that the conditions for thinking the future of our planet are already pleasant, present on the African continent. And that the African continent offers an image of a world in which nations are disaggregated or sort of fall apart, in which humans are unsettled, in, in which they are mobile, and cultural formations are shared and refracted across, across borders of nations and regions. The sentiment in broad outline is at the center of the loosely defined field of global South studies, which I would define as a field constituted around the question of knowledge from the global South. And this sentiment also pulses through the work, um, through a book published just a few weeks ago by the Cameroonian scholar Ashil Mbembe. The book is uh, Out of the Dark Night, Essays on Decolonization which wrestles again with the legacy and the future of African decolonization in ways and in rhetoric that can sometimes feel a bit like a throwback to the 1960s. So what I'm gonna do here, and I'm sort of, I'm wrapping up, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna think about um, some very contemporary work from the African continent. Um, as I said, Ashil Mbeme is Cameroonian. He teaches in South Africa at the University of the Vic Vatersand. Um, but to think about how we might imagine rather than sort of Ireland Africa relations being on a shared being based on a shared colonial past or even being based on some kind of you know loosely defined but in sort of, you know, rather ill-defined uh, notion of solidarity but that Irish African relations could be thought about as imagining together a future um, and that I want to sort of you know place my finger on the idea of Africa as a generator of knowledge about our future planet. Um, and I'm drawing you know, very heavily on people like Raymond Connell, on the Komarovs, on um, Ashil Mbembe, and a, a whole field of work in Global South Studies to do this. So this is not, I didn't sort of you know, come up with this on my own. Me, ah, here we go. Here's a longish quote from Ashil Mbembe. We are far from having left behind this era of righteousness, whose apogee was colonialism, and which sanctions force, ignorance, and the right to a clear conscience. Our era that we live in now is attempting to bring back into fashion the old myth that the West alone has a monopoly on the future. 
Under these circumstances, it's hardly surprising that some seek to deny all paradigmatic meaning to the phenomena of colonialism and imperialism and to bury the serious philosophical and ethical dilemmas that came out of European expansion by consigning them to the re register of an insignificant detail. What uh, Sheila Mbembe is doing here is, is taking on this argument now you know, quite common in both France and the UK that colonialism was not a defining force in the world, that this was insignificant, it was just a detail, that we have all moved on from that. And he's saying, you know, that, that's, not, that's not true. In fact, we're still living through that moment. Ours is an era in which the only valid morality is a morality reduced to the instinct of pity. That is to say, the only valid morality in the West really is a morality it reduced to the instinct of pity to a thousand forms of contempt masked by charity and good Samaritanism to the belief that the victor is after all right. Under these conditions, the major challenge facing, facing our time is to refound critical knowledge. That is, thinking that thinks its possibility outside of itself, aware of the limits of its singularity within the circuit that always connects us to an elsewhere. It's quite dense prose, but I want to sort of pick out this idea at the very end, to think outside of ourselves connected to an elsewhere. If there's one thing I would say that Irish studies could learn here, it's the invocation to connect to an elsewhere, not to dilute the singularity of Ireland, but to imagine it always relationally not as its own center, but always a node within a network. And again, I'm going to point to Darry Gannon's work and Fergal McGarry and others who are looking at, you know, the sort of the, the non-singularity or the non-exceptionalism of Irish independence movements and thinking about it as a global phenomenon that is part of a whole series of, you know, of, of movements, of ideas and, and thoughts. But what Mbembe is also suggesting is that imagining a connection to elsewhere that, that we can imagine a connection to elsewhere and what it looks like when it's not based on a shared colonial past or on a history of migration. And so and to, to think about, say, Ireland-Africa relations that are not based solely, not to say that we need to ignore them, but they're not based solely on you know, the Irish missionary movement or Irish humanitarianism or anything else, but on a form of imagination of the future to think about it, to think about what Africa can offer to Ireland and elsewhere as a sort of an image of a future world. And I'll give you one last long quote from Mbembe here. The invention of an alternative imaginary of life, power, and the planet requires renewing transversal solidarities. Those that go beyond clan, race, and ethnic affiliations, mobilizing the religious resources of spiritualities of deliverance, consolidating and transnationalizing the institutions of civil society, renewing juridical activism, developing capacity for swarming, and an idea of life in the arts that would be the foundation of radical democratic thought. I want to pause there and point out the phrase transversal solidarities, um, a new form of solidarity that goes beyond affiliations, that imagines a sort of a solidarity of knowledges. If Africans, this is his very last um, paragraph, this is where he's sort of channeling Aimé Césaire and Franz Fanon and all of those sort of older um, uh, arguments about um, decolonization. If Africans want to stand up and walk, sooner or later they must look elsewhere than to Europe. Europe is undoubtedly not a dying world, but weary, it now represents the world of declining life and crimson sunsets. Here the spirit has faded eaten away by extreme forms of pessimism, nihilism, and frivolity. Africa will have to turn its gaze toward the new. It will have to stage itself and for the first time accomplish what has never before been possible. It will have to do this with awareness that it is opening new ages for itself and for the planet. Um, what Mbembe is you know, invoking in a sense is the same as a Komarov thing he's doing in a, in a different way, more sophisticated in many ways. Um, but the same as the Komarovs, that Africa is indeed a sort of an image of the future of our planet, um, not some sort of, you know, something stuck in the past, but in fact, an imagination of what the planet will look like in 50 to 100 years. I'm going to give you one a very concrete example. Uh, well, I guess they were probably actually um, not concrete at all, but um, steel, I don't know, something. Um, very concrete example of how we might look to the African continent in order to imagine a future of Europe or of Ireland. Last year, outside a fancy hotel in Dublin, the Shelburne, 
And amid a whole series of arguments around the world about symbols and statues in Ireland, the UK, the US and elsewhere, the owners of this fancy hotel engaged a contractor to take down statues of African female bodies holding up lamps. And this is one of the empty plinths or the stand on which those bodies were. A whole series of arguments ensued with the usual tired claims that somehow by removing these lamps, history was being erased as if those statues represented any authentic kind of history. They were, in fact, part of a wave of Egyptomania in Europe. Um, these were, these were um, so-called Nubian princesses um, with enslaved girls at their feet. Um, so these, this was a wave of Egyptomania in the late 19th century. They were when the hotel was built uh, around the time of the building of the Suez Canal. There was an outrage in Dublin at the desecration of an historic building, and it didn't help that the owners of the building were American. And there was praise. Uh, on the other hand, there was praise for the action for the removal of these statues. I'm, I'm purposely not showing you the statues because I don't want to sort of, you know, in a way, reproduce that imagery. Um, it was a very unseemly and a very ill-informed debate. You know, on the one hand, you're erasing history. On the other hand, everything has to go. What there was very little of at the time, outside of a small number of astute observers, was an engagement with a by then mature debate in South Africa, in Ghana, and elsewhere about the removal of symbols, particularly the statue of Cecil Rhodes, the arch imperialist um, that was removed at the University of Cape Town in um, South Africa. One second here as I'm dealing with a little technological glitch on this screen in front of me. There we go. So there was outrage at the day, um, sorry, um, there was, there was very little engagement with what I called a, a by then mature debate in South Africa and Ghana and elsewhere um, about the removal of statues, particularly the statue of Cecil John Rhodes, um, which was removed from the campus of the University of Cape Town in student protests in 2015. South Africa had already reckoned with symbols. The issue was not and has not been in any way cleanly resolved, but there was here from the global south, from the southern tip of Africa, a rich body of knowledge and theory and practice and argument readily available to be drawn on that recognized the cognitive power of public symbols and their impact on those for whom these symbols form the furniture of their daily lives. The debate was already well advanced in South Africa. It was nuanced, thoughtful, but also fraught and difficult, and as I said, very much unsettled. But that debate was, in, was mostly invisible in Irish public life. In the end, the owners of the hotel put the statues back up, giving in to demands that what is historic, what had served in a long time, must also be permanent. And so I just wanted to point out that there's a sense in which there was an, an opportunity for people in Dublin last year to engage with a body of theory and a body of knowledge and practice from the global south that was completely missed. Um, and misunderstanding of the fact that, that you know, we might say that Africa offers solutions and offers an idea of a future. So I want to end my talk today um, by turning my question upside down. So I asked, what is Africa to Irish studies? Um, we could say Irish studies to Africa. And I think that's probably particularly important since uh, the British University of Egypt is a research center for Irish studies on the continent of Africa, even if it's also a you know, Middle East, North Africa uh, region. The implication of that question in one sense is that Irish studies and the implication of the foundation of the research center, I think um, Dr. Rafi Khalil can, uh, can um, uh, correct me on this, but I assume that the implication is that Irish studies does have something to say to the continent and to the Middle East, North Africa region. Otherwise, why set up a center? And that's true. I'm a resolute believer in the continued need to teach, in, say in my case, Irish literature across the globe. And not just because as Joe Biden keeps saying, Irish literature is the best, but because it tells us something very complicated in very compelling ways, a complex story of social change under and in the aftermath of empire and it grapples with a language in which to express the contradictions of our modern world. The same can be said for Irish history, politics, and more. This is a site, Ireland, that is a case study for a whole series of modern transformations that happen rapidly and in a highly visible way in Ireland. At the same time, though, I want to make an appeal for a humility and a hospitality in the field of Irish studies, a recognition that the questions of the future 
will not be the same as those of the past. And that long silenced knowledge from the global south and from the African continent in particular, the site of what Gayatri Spivak calls the cognitive violence of colonialism, that this long standing knowledge not, not only must be heard, as if this were a time for fairness, but is a generator of questions and answers for the future of our planet. Unless we in the global north and unless scholars of Irish literature and Irish studies recognize the sort of the capacity and the future of the world in the global south, we are looking the wrong way in many ways. Um, so with that, I'll end. And I, again, I just, you know, in a way, this whole talk has been, in a sense, a, a congratulatory talk to the British University of Egypt on engaging and articulating Irish studies and African studies and Middle East North Africa studies um, and thinking about the possibilities for the future of bringing those areas together. So I, I do really mean it when I sort of say this is an exciting prospect for me and I'm, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you with questions now if I can figure out just how to stop sharing my screen. Oh, there it is. It worked now. So, okay. Okay, Professor, uh, thank you for your valuable knowledge. Um, normally, at this point, uh, I'm supposed to summarize everything you said, but uh, uh, I don't, uh, I would like to betray some of, uh, I mean, everything you said was uh, quite relevant and pertinent, and so many themes and topics were tackled with, uh, I could feel a kind of passion. Thank you very much again. Thank you for your knowledge of some topics that uh, might be quite uh, difficult for a lot of people. Yeah. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you had the opportunity to uh, get uh, a view on your uh, chat box. I just said that uh, if you would like to ask questions, uh, you could uh, write on the chat box. Right now, I do have uh, two questions, uh, only for Professor Collins, except if there are other people who would like to uh, ask questions. I will start with the questions that I have uh, in the chat box, uh, Professor Collins, if uh, you don't mind. Is that okay for you? Yeah, yeah, they look great, actually. I just looked at them. Um, so thanks for those. OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, the first question I've got here comes from somebody from Central Africa in Gabon. Uh, what was the contribution of Irish literature in the fight against the South African apartheid system? Yeah, that's um, so. Uh, no, Cyprian, uh, Cyprian, um, uh, that's Cyprian Mungoli. Mungoli. From, Thank uh, you so Gabon, much. Um, in Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's great to get a question from a scholar from Gabon um, about South African uh, and Irish history. Um, that's a tough question. It's always a tough question. A, a tough. Um, a proposition to think about how literature impacts the world. Um, uh, but I see there's also a question from Dr. Singh um, that's related to that, so I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Um, but you know, we let's we, we we can also think about literature in in many ways as sort of a, you know broad sense. So, for example, I um, mentioned the fact that Thabo Mbeki, who was the second um, president of the free South Africa, a complicated and kind of problematic person in many ways, Mbeki um, was hugely, I mean, you, we cannot underestimate the way that Mbeki was um, influenced by the speeches of Robert Emmett, a, uh, an Irish freedom fighter in the early 19th century. Uh, in many ways, it was Robert Emmett sort of soaring, um, soaring rhetoric that Mbeki uh, thought of and, and imagined a way of sort of thinking of the world in generous and wide and open ways. Uh, Mbeki wasn't always like that, but the very fact that he was inspired by this work and by this writing, I would say, you know, Robert Emmett, it's a speech from the dock, but it was you know, very heavily edited uh, and it became a sort of a, an a really important part 
of the Irish imagination in the 19th century and the creation of the nation in the 19th century that sort of you know a, a brought a romantic sensibility of a relationship between nation, people, and language, uh, and the idea of freedom that brought that into the public discourse uh, in the early 19th century, Robert Emmett. Um, and so that we can think about that as sort of one direct example. There are easier ways to think about relations between Irish literature, Irish and South African literature, or between Irish politics and South African politics, right? So as I laid out, the, we think about the relation between the ANC and the IRA, which is a very mutual relationship, although not by any means deep, very much a sort of a surface level, although important because Cyril Ramaphosa, the current president of South Africa, was a, was a part of the peace process and the negotiations. He sort of was a guarantor of peace in Northern Ireland. So on the political front, there are many and long standing relations. On the literary front, you have South African writers like, in particular, the one I mentioned, J.M. Kutsia, um, but also uh, Nadine Gordimer, and even the Afrikaans writers, um, the name of one of which I um, uh, for, uh, evades me, but in fact, he wrote, one, he, he lived in Ireland for a while, and he was a major part of this sort of um, quite independent streak of Afrikaans speaking writers in South Africa. So that's to say, we can't sort of look to literature for its immediate impact on the world. But in many ways, there were quite strong links um, between Irish, South, uh, Irish literature and South African politics. Uh, and in, and in, the, in the 1980s and 1990s, between South African politics back to uh, Ireland. So that's a sort of a brief summary of a huge field. Um, there is a, so I did edit a, edit a special issue on Ireland and South Africa um, just, just this year. So Cyprian, if you can get your hands on it, and if you can't, you can email me. Um, and I will, I can send you all of those like 10 essays on Ireland and South Africa. I'll be happily, happy to send them. But thanks for the question. Um, do we have your mail, Professor? Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me, um, I, I'll put it in the chat actually right now to, um, to all of you. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. While you while you while you read the uh, the second question, I had it at the on the first slide, but I'll put it in the chat right now. Okay. Um, the second question is uh, uh, from I think uh, Doctor E. Himanda. I Himanda Singh. Uh, I hope uh, the pronunciation of the uh, name is uh, fine and sound. Uh, uh, the doctor uh, is asking, is there any special connection between Africa and Ireland with respect to Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart and uh, W.B. Yeats, The Second Coming? And the second aspect of the question, if yes, why? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, uh, Dr. Singh. Um, for those who are not familiar, Achebe's, the, the, the title of Achebe's novel, Things Fall Apart, comes from Yeats's um, incredibly moving poem uh, written in 1919, The Second Coming. Um, Yeats was writing this at a period of what felt like gathering violence in Ireland, um, but he was also writing it at the end of the um, First World War in the wake of the Russian Revolution. And it turns out, you know, more recently, we've been thinking a lot about the fact that, the, you know, we think about a pandemic here because Yates was writing it while his father and his wife were very sick with the Spanish flu. Um, so it was sort of 1918 to 1919 was when he sort of was writing and revising it. So. It's a poem that's hugely important in Irish literature because it sort of captures the spirit of a moment of promise and terror. Um, there's another phrase he used in a different poem, Easter 1916, when he talks about a terrible beauty being born. Um, and in many ways, that's what the second coming uh, gives us as well. Is there a special relationship? Ye Yeats was widely read across the empire. Um, at the Anglophone world, the British Empire, he was widely read for a lot of reasons, one of which, a major part of which has to do with the fact that many uh, people who were teaching literature, teaching English in schools across the empire were Irish. They were Irish nuns and Irish priests. Um, and Achebe, 
and uh, Shoyinka and uh, a whole and Christopher Akibo encountered Irish literature through the education system in the 1950s and I, I guess a, bit, a little bit earlier than that for Achebe. Um, so that's one special connection. I'll give you a, an example from India. Um, the, the current US, uh, the current Irish ambassador to the US, Daniel Mulhall, used to work in India. He was, uh, he was in the, the office in um, uh, the, the embassy in Delhi. And uh, he said that he encountered at one point this quite old lady who, when she found out that he was the ambassador, or you know, part of the Irish embassy in India, she immediately started spouting Yeats's poetry among which was the second coming. And uh, it turns out that um, she was, in fact, Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru's sister. And Nehru, the Prime Minister of India, and his sister and many other people were incarcerated in the 1920s and 1930s. And in prison, this is where she learned much of Yeats in prison, she was, in fact, reading, she and Nehru and others were reading Yeats's poetry. It was one of the few things that was available to them. Um, there's a long, and in fact, there's a great essay by a guy called Ronan McDonald that was just published this year about what he calls the charisma of the second coming. There's a long history across the 20th century of uh, an engagement with this poem in largely in the global south in places of anti-colonial resistance, because it's a poem that captures so much of the terror, the promise, the fear of the modern world and a world that's sort of emerging into a new space that is and into a sort of millennialism um, that is, as I said, sort of, you know, a, a, an object of fear and terror. So there is a special relationship. Uh, a lot of it has to do with education, but there's also something about the poem itself that captures so much um, so much of the, the world's imagination. I'll, I'll, I realize it's a long, I just, I love that poem and I love this story, um, but there's a there's an Irish critic called Fintan O'Toole who talks about there being something as, a, what does he call it, the, I think it's the Yates Index. And what he means is, um, what he means by that is that um, there's a way that we can tell how screwed the world is if we count the number of times that politicians quote Yates. So when they all talk about things fall apart, we realize that the world is in terrible danger. Um, uh, and you can see this everywhere you see it, everything from um, Tabo and Becky, actually, to go back to Tabo and Becky, at the uh, Bandung conference in um, one of the last Bandung conferences to take place, it was in um, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, Tabo Mbeki himself, uh, just at, on the eve of the Iraq war in 2003, Tabo Mbeki was quoting Yates saying, things fall apart. Um, and there's a way in which we've returned to that poem now for a hundred years to capture some of the violence of the world. And it's a way that Yates can be used in many ways and is often used to understand the world that we live in um, and that he offers to us a sort of an index for the modern world. But it's a great question. Thank, thanks for it. Thanks again. As we are moving on, I think I've got a last question on the chat box by, oh, okay, the owner has got the galaxy, so I can't uh, really see the name. The question is, is there any African literature department in Irish universities? Professor, can you give us an answer to this uh, question? Uh, we could also ask the question, are there any African literature departments in African universities? Um, the answer, I think, across the board is that there aren't enough. Um, no, there aren't African literature um, departments at Irish universities. There are certainly scholars who work in the field. Um, the extent to which they do African and comparative literature is, you know, varies from one to the other. But I think that's really important because there are also very few people teaching African history um, or African politics. And in general, and this is not, you know, to throw anybody under the bus, this is not to point fingers, there, you know, there's, a, there's been a sort of a long history of Irish universities thinking through their curriculum, but it hasn't been a priority. Um, but I would say that also about universities on the African continent, right? So you know, outside of places like Kenyatta and Makerere, um, there are many departments of English literature where sometimes African literature is taught, 
But to think about African literature as a body of knowledge and to think about it as a discipline or as a, as a field and to think about African literary studies as a discipline um, has not been the way that we've approached African literature. Um, and I think that's a, a, to go back to that word that I used, I mean, it's a deficit in the world when we don't, you know, generally see across universities in the global north in particular, but also on the African continent, we don't generally see the value of the teaching of African literature just as much as we teach, see the value of the teaching of Irish or English or American literature. Um, and that is a long standing um, that is a long-standing um, deficit and a long-standing result of the devaluation of African knowledge and the devaluation of Africa as a producer of knowledge. Um, I had a great colleague in Cape Town. He has passed away since, sadly, Harry Garuba, who spoke eloquently, long and eloquently, about how African studies as a field is the future of interdisciplinary thinking. Um, and how Africa offers, in many ways, across literature and everything else, offers new formations of knowledge and questions. Um, and the extent to which the world ignores African knowledge and knowledge from the global south is the extent to which it fails to hear the complexity of the world around it. But it's a, it's a great question. And that was from Lucas in uh, Libreville, Gabon. So uh, thanks, Lucas. Lucas Mazambi from Libreville, Gabon. It was uh, the last question that was submitted to you, Professor. Mr. Mazambi, Lucas from Gabon. It was, uh, I think your answers did uh, really match their expectations, as uh, Dr. Singh uh, writes here, and uh, also thanks you. Uh, there is uh, another question. What are the expectations of uh, Irish universities from African literature? Professor, you do have the floor. Yeah, that's another question from, um, from Lucas. Uh, similar, obviously, to the last one. I'm not, I'm not totally sure how to answer it. Um, I would say that, you know, I'd go back to the, the thing that I said before, is it largely African literature or African, Africa as a producer of knowledge, and I don't mean to just talk about literature, but Africa as a producer of knowledge and Africa as a producer of theory has largely been invisible um, in Ireland. Much of that, Ireland, you know, as a, as a post-colonial country in its own right, um, um, and, you know, Northern Ireland is complicated in that regard, um, but that Ireland has spent much time rethinking and reshaping its own curriculum towards Ireland and away from Britain uh, and from Europe. Uh, and that was the sort of movement over the course of the 20th century. And it takes a long time to write that ship. Um, there are few people um, who teach global history. There are few teach a few people who teach um, world literature. Um, and that's, I mean, I, again, I, I don't mean to sort of say that there's a, I don't mean to in, in any way point fingers at the Irish Academy, but to say that, you know, there's an opportunity here. Um, and that opportunity has not yet been grasped, but there are certainly many, many scholars uh, working in that area. But I, I would like to see, and I think I, you know, there are many people, anybody who works in that area would like to see significantly more. And that's just not, not just Ireland. We can say that in Britain, we could say that in the US, and we can say that across. Um, the, the world, and that's the argument that Mbembe and Komarovs and Raywin Connell and others m make, and anybody who works in Global South Studies, is that in fact there has been a, a very significant uh, inability to engage with the Global South as a site of the production of knowledge. It's not, it's not an individual person, it's a structural or systemic thing, um, and much of it has to do with the long-term um, and profound devaluation of indigenous knowledge under empire. Um, and that, that takes a very, very long time to, 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 to turn that ship around um, in many ways. So that, it's not a, again, it's not, a, it's not an issue about Ireland, um, but it's a sort of a, this, and I feel like the, the British University of Egypt and its research center in Irish studies is a real invitation to think about exactly that question about how we engage 
Ireland and the continent of Africa and Middle East and North Africa. Um, there are, I think of somebody like um, Hussein Omar, an Egyptian scholar at University College Dublin, Donald Hassett at University College Cork. I mean, I think the discipline of history is much better at engaging with the African continent um, and with the, the global South than the discipline of literature has been. But that's a that's a sort of general thing about literature, which still remains very much stuck in nations. Um, but yeah, as I say, it's it's systemic. It's not an individual. It's not these are not individual decisions. It's systemic um, and needs to be addressed on a systemic basis and needs to be addressed as a, as the recognition of the value of knowledge and theory and practice produced in the global south. But mm -hmm. Lucas, th thanks for the question. I, I, it's it's great to have these questions and it's great to hear from scholars in Gabon and India and Mali and and elsewhere. It's a real it's a real pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Collins. And I saw uh, Professor uh, uh, Shadia uh, raising yes. her hands. Uh, she kindly yes. has the floor if she like. Thank to. you. I just um, wanted to thank you very much, uh, Professor Parson, for this um, valuable and insightful really um, uh, discussion about Africa um, in, in Irish studies and Irish studies. It, it was very insightful. And I wanted to ask, uh, first I also wanted to thank you for uh, your um, well-informed um, um, information about the publications uh, of your host. Uh, that was back in 2004. And uh, we always were interested in actually Irish uh, literature and Irish studies. And I uh, was wondering whether you can um, talk, us, uh, talk to us more about your publications in this area and uh, directions, new directions of research um, in, in this area of Irish studies and uh, Africa. Please. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Raid. Um, I really appreciate it. And thanks you know, again to you, to, to Rania, everybody for the invitation. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, you know, I'm I'm just one scholar. Uh, and I, I can't I can't imagine I, I can't even try to be an expert in all of these areas. Um, I think that the future is in work like research centers like yours at the British University of Egypt that brings together scholars across disciplines and brings together many scholars to produce sort of aggregate knowledge. And I see that happening very particularly in Europe and um, with these sort of large scale research clusters that are being built on the work of Ephesus, the European Federation for associations and centers of Irish studies. Um, and so in many ways, the future, I hope that the future is collaborative and the future is the recognition of the limitation of the single scholar and the recognition of the capacity of many people to come together and um, to workshop, to, to think together in a place like Cairo um, and, to sh and to find the shared questions of the future. Um, yeah. I've been working uh, on a, a monograph on telescopes, which is a funny thing to write about, but it's actually, uh, it's, it's, it's based in the late 19th, early 20th century. It's about this, um, it's a story of this one company in Dublin uh, that made really large scale telescopes to, to astronomical telescopes um, and sent them around the world from Melbourne to Wellington, to Cape Town, Johannesburg, um, uh, Los Angeles, Vienna. Um, and they were used to sort of make very significant um, uh, interventions and very significant discoveries in astronomy. But I'm interested in how that translated into the imagination of writers, particularly modernist writers, mm -hmm. say Olive Schreiner in South Africa, um, uh, Jagdish Chandra Bose, who was a science fiction writer in India, or you know, uh, Virginia Woolf in, uh, in, um, in London how sort of astronomical knowledge, particularly that that was sort of built by on this system of telescopes built in Dublin, how that helped people to understand and imagine the planet um, and the shape of the future of the universe. Um, and so it, it puts Ireland in the center in a way. You're, you're back. All right. Yeah, you're good. And yes. It puts Ireland in the center in a way, but I, I don't want to. I want to decenter it and think about the way that Ireland is, is part of a network of knowledge. Um, about humans' place on our planet and our planet's place in the universe as we discover in the late 19th century that our planet is not unique, our species is not unique, 
and our galaxy is not unique and what are the sort of philosophical implications. But I've also been working on editing, as um, Dr. Gui uh, Mundong said, I've also been working on editing a collection of 20 essays, 21, I think now, essays on Irish literature and global perspective. And that includes Africanists, includes people from India, includes um, scholars from um, New Zealand and Australia, from North and South America. And to think about what would the study of Irish literature look like if we decenter the island of Ireland and think about it as being part of a network or a system, we, there are a whole lot of different words that we could use of um, of uh, knowledges and knowledge formations. Um, so that's what I'm working on, and that's again, I, I want to you know sort of say and congratulate you and the British University on the collaborative work that is emerging and your engagement with collaboration across disciplines and across and across fields because in many ways the only way that we can decenter and deterritorialize is to reach out to other scholars across other disciplines who ask different questions and across other fields who ask different questions um i think in many ways about my own encounters in south africa uh, and how it transformed to use a very South African word, but how it transformed the way that I think about Irish literature. Um, uh, it, my, my first book on mapping and mapping technologies was heavily influenced by work that I did and by stuff that I learned uh, in a research group, the Archive and Public Culture Research Group at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And that just gives you an example. I, I have been fortunate, not all scholars can travel in the way that I can travel. Not all scholars have the resources to engage in the way that I have had, and I've been lucky, and in many ways, I, I sort of want to, you know, try to model what it might look like um, with those resources to engage with others who can bring new new knowledges and new and new ideas. So thanks for asking the question. That's a, sort of a, in many ways, I just want to collaborate for the rest of my life. <laughs> Probably thank you very right much, for... actually. Thank you, actually. You really opened the way for a new uh, area of research, uh, as you mentioned. And uh, we hope one day uh, you will come to Egypt. We will, would like to uh, hold the conference here in Egypt, with, uh, uh, and, and we really hope that you will all join us, inshallah. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. The last question comes from uh, Mr. Cheik, he's from Guinea. What are some similarities and differences between Irish studies and South African studies? Yeah, um, it's a, so Irish studies is a sort of an inter interdisciplinary field in many ways and it's recognized by the, by the British University. Um, there, there's, no necessarily not necessarily an equivalent in South African studies um African studies in general much larger um sort of forms a similar block obviously you know, much larger much more complicated much more rich um than anything that that Ireland can offer um but there are some ways that I think in the field of literature there are some ways that I think there are similarities and I'm speaking here as a specialist in the field of Irish literature, not in the field of South African literature. That's not my area of specialty. Um, but uh, I've been thinking a lot really about the question of language um, and the fact that when we, and I sort of cut this out of my talk, the fact that when we compare Ireland and South Africa, the implication is usually that these are comparable places because of the language question because of the um, fluency of South Africans in English and the fluency of Irish people in English. Uh, English is not an indigenous language in either Ireland or in South Africa. Um, in Ireland, of course, it is a dominant language, but there are other languages, and particularly the Irish language, um, that have become invisible in many ways. So the language question in South Africa is even more complicated because you have the two sort of major languages of the systems of power, both in, of course, the 20, across the 20th century, and they are, they are Afrikaans or Dutch, sort of a you know, newer version of Dutch, um, and English. And when we think about comparisons that look to English alone, you're looking at a language that is spoken as a primary tongue 
by a very small percentage of the population. And that there are 11 official languages in South Africa, um, many of which have been occluded or invisible um, in the sort of the public discourse. And so in one ways, there's a really good answer, really good argument for not comparing Ireland and South Africa, because that comparison is often built on the the sort of the possibility of using English as the language of comparison, and that cuts out a huge structure of um, of cultural production in South Africa in all of the eleven official languages and other languages, um, and in fact in languages that have been lost um, in languages I wouldn't say lost that suggests that it, it happened accidentally languages that have been destroyed. Um, so that's a sort of long and slightly complicated answer, but it gives you a sense of maybe some of the complications of even thinking uh, Ireland and Africa together um, because of the question of language. So until we start, and I can't because I do not speak any um, uh, indigenous African languages, until we start thinking, and it's another sort of argument for collaboration, until we start thinking about the complex linguistic landscape of Africa as against English and as against uh, Irish literature in English or even Irish literature in Irish, um, we are in many ways uh, not engaging with the full complexity of South Africa or anywhere else. And that's a, that is future work to be done in collaboration. Um, but it's a, it's a really great question. So thanks, thanks for the question. Well, well thank, you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. It's well, it is uh, well understood, really. Thank you. Thank you, and I guess uh, all the participants would like to utter the same uh, phrase. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Collins, for this uh, brilliant uh, workshop. And uh, thanks also to the British University of uh, Egypt for having organized this really fruitful uh, event. And uh, I guess everybody here attending this workshop is especially uh, more especially satisfied with uh, your performance, Professor. But I'm also sure that you have heard these words a lot of time in your life uh, uh, as uh, a professor. Now, uh, a special thank again for uh, Professor Shadia and for Dr. Rania to have hosted this event. Thank you very much to have allowed me to be the humble moderator for this uh, very, very fruitful event. I'm pretty sure that my uh, teachers in the countries in, in some other areas in Africa are going to redesign their uh, topics, uh, uh, revisit their curricula in order to include some assets and some facets of what you have just disclosed to us uh, this uh, afternoon, evening, or this morning for you who are in the USA. Thank you very much. Now, and, uh, please. And I'd like to, uh, I'd like to thank off. you. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to thank you uh, oh. all for this very um, valuable and uh, insightful uh, seminar. Uh, we're here from uh, Ireland, from Africa, from USA, from Gabon, Egypt, and um, it's, it's really an international and global re research seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Naguma, as well, for, your, uh, for joining us and for your time. <laughs> Thank you for, for your time and for your uh, insightful comments. Um, I can't thank you enough, uh, Dr. Parson, uh, for uh, this uh, very rich and insightful um, uh, seminar and your discussion was very valuable. I'm sure it will be very uh, useful for all our researchers. And again, I would uh, love to see you all in Egypt. After the pandemic, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have a conference and would love to see you all. Thank you, Dr. Rania, for uh, organizing this. and. See you again.